In the life sets the record straight. In news. How did this ringer get into the White House press corps? Media. And no matter what they cook up, what egg they lay behind bars, it's not going to change the facts. And the animated world of politics. I'd like Margaret Spellings to look me in the eye and look at my children and tell me how I do harm to America. All this and me on the Pride edition of In the Life. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Overbrook Foundation, the Pride Foundation, Jeff B. Sorrell, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life, I'm Janine Garofalo. There's much division over social issues that directly affect the LGBT community, and many believe the time has come for an honest dialogue. The mission of In the Life is to tell the personal stories of LGBT people whose contributions can be felt, seen, and heard in almost every facet of our culture. And we, along with many of you, often wonder why these stories aren't more well depicted in mainstream America. Tonight, in Setting the Record Straight, we examined the cultural bias facing the LGBT community in today's American media and the potential political fallout of representation, whether it is sensationalized or non-existent. Before we begin, a few messages from In the Life's voicemail. Going to the first message. Hi, I have to tell you, we don't hate you. We hate the sin. I was very upset watching put that to program that. Drop. In the Life. Yeah. You go back to the family between one man and one woman. They need to stay out of the church. You guys are going to go to hell. I have a right to discriminate, and I got will. Gays and lesbians have often been portrayed as a dangerous influence on America's children. Recently, one animated bunny's visit to Vermont garnered tremendous attention from Washington and was pulled from national PBS distribution before it even aired. The couple and their three children who appeared in the Sugar Time episode of Postcard from Buster are still trying to figure out why. Censorship. This is about what we teach our children in terms of decency and, and common respect. Homophobia affects us all. The Department of Education funds Ready to Learn, which helps fund children's programs on PBS. Cartoon characters like Buster the Rabbit and SpongeBob SquarePants are being attacked for teaching kids basic messages about tolerance, acceptance, and diversity. I think it's fear of difference. I mean, that's, that's what we all felt was the problem. Sugar Time is one of 40 episodes in the series Postcards from Buster. Sugar Time was an episode where Buster, as he is wont to do in every episode, travels to meet a new family in a new location where we learn about that corner of the world. Hey, Buster, hey, where you up to? Sugar Time. I was working on a national project called America 24-7. And one of the photos that ran in this book was of a lesbian couple and their child. WGBH in Boston saw the picture, and they wanted to do a segment on lesbians and, um, or two-mom family. And they called me and asked me if uh, I could introduce them to some families. Long story short, they ended up choosing our family and my daughter, Emma. In this case, he was going to Vermont during uh, sugaring season when they get the maple sap from the trees. Hi, Buster. I'm Gillian. Hi, Gillian. Hi. You want to come on in? Buster. Hi, Karen. Nice to meet you. Bo? Hi. Good to see you. You too. Oh, Buster, look at you. You look just like your mom. Do you have to meet my kids? My name's David. I'm Emma. And my name's James. These aren't people that we cast into these roles. These are real families that Buster goes and visits. 
and we're grateful to these families for opening their homes to us and showing us the communities they live in. So Gillian's your mom too? She's my stepmom. Boy, that's a lot of moms. Yep, this is mom and Gillian right here. That's a nice picture. This is one of my favorite pictures. We were very proud to be associated with that kind of production. And the kids, the idea of being part of a, a show that they got to show off their family to other children, you know, like they've been watching on TV. This was, this was an enormous sense of pride for them. And then to be told that their family is not appropriate enough for a national audience, that's quite a hit to take. Through no fault of their own did they find themselves sort of um, immersed in this controversy. In January 2005, newly appointed Education Secretary Margaret Spellings sent a controversial letter to PBS President Pat Mitchell asking that the episode be pulled before it aired. Margaret Spelling said that the lifestyle portrayed in this episode was something that parents of young children might not want them exposed to. And we really were appalled, especially when we learned the purpose of this video is to have children across the, across the country learn about different cultures within the U.S. and also learn about language. The letter also stated that um, the idea of using public funding for this kind of content was inappropriate. And Spelling's final statement? You can be assured that in the future, the department will be more clear as to its expectations for any future programming that it funds. Has many concerned over the independence of public television. Let me say a few words about this department. One of the first things you notice is that there is no ivory tower. We're horrified when we see governments in charge of all the message and media that comes out to the public. And yet, that's exactly what she's saying she needs to do. And um, it, she locked that ivory tower up solid because nowhere else would we accept this. The funding may only be renewed under conditions that they're going to have to agree. I mean, this is a huge question for PBS in general. Forget all the other issues. Who is funding public television? When you look at the original mandate, the Carnegie mandate for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, it states that the corporation will serve underserved populations and provide a voice to people who don't have it otherwise. Obviously, Margaret Spellings has made that clear that we don't have a voice. You know, so if she's going to control the content of the one place where we're able to be heard and, and seen, what, what's left? What's left? Buster has actually visited the Mormons in Utah. He's visited Pentecostal Christians. He's visited Orthodox Jews. All of those segments of the population were fine, except gays and lesbians. I can't speculate as to the timing or, or the why of it. Um, you know, I, I can say that we've, we've never received a letter from a cabinet secretary before. Um, about a particular pro program, anyway. Every day I hear Margaret Spellings say that parents wouldn't want to be exposed to us. And um, it's crushing because we know that they go to school every day and are exposed to it. We know that all the children that see us pick our kids up from school are exposed to it and that there are millions of us all over the country that are being seen. So. Like it or not, they're being exposed to it. So why can't they be exposed to it pleasantly, you know, with a, with a kind grace about it? They're giving license to everyone else in this country to bully and, and be prejudiced and, and make gays and lesbians feel like they don't belong. I pledge to run an open, honest, and accessible department, one that operates with integrity at all levels. In the Life contacted Secretary Spellings to ask for an explanation of the letter. After originally agreeing to do the interview, her office retracted on behalf of not only Secretary Spellings, but the entire Department of Education. She's gone into hiding. Now, Pat Mitchell, on the other hand, then wrote us a letter. It was a bona fide apology. Dear Karen and Gillian, I want to let you know personally how much I regret the effects that PBS's decision not to distribute the Sugar Time episode of Postcards from Buster must have had on you and your family. She was. Um, completely sorry that this had affected us personally as a family and what this had done to our lives. However, she said, we are still clear that we made the responsible decision. My responsibility as the CEO of PBS ultimately lies with the PBS stations and the very divergent communities across the country that they serve. 
Those stations have told us that they want PBS children's programming to be sharply focused on educational objectives and free from the type of controversy that we readily embrace and pursue in our adult programming. Margaret Spelling's letter literally arrived the afternoon of the day that we had decided to not distribute the episode, but it came hours after we had made our decision and communicated it to the producers. The producers called us from WGBH. They were great. They said, listen, we want you to know what's going on. And the Boston Globe had broke the story the day before saying that they had postponed the, the airing date um, so that the PBS affiliates could have a little bit more time to evaluate the tape. The next day came the, you know, the next phone call saying they're not going to run it, but we're still going to send it out to anyone who will run it. It became clear, though, as we saw the cut come in and then the kind of the controversy start to surround it, that this episode that wasn't about an exploration of different family structures, it was about Vermont and Sugar Time, it was getting in the way. It was just obscuring what the actual point of the episode was, and it just seemed like there was nothing we could do to avoid that. Well, the issue is not, it's not focusing on their daughter. The issue is, again, this is a mature theme for children in preschool. We are sexualizing our children at a very early age. Why do children that are, that are in preschool need to know about homosexuality? Uh, this is where we went with our conversation on Good Morning America. This is, you know, immediately everybody's talking about the sex act. And there's nothing sexual about the episode. For tomorrow's dinner, I need you to get me some maple syrup for the baked beans, okay? Yeah. And cheesecake, I'm gonna make a maple cheesecake. And I need cheddar cheese. We're hearing over and over how we are sexualizing our children at too young an age. And I completely agree that. But it's not by exposing them to, to a two-mom family living in Vermont who sends their kids off to get some cheese for you know our macaroni and cheese dinner. And so these are the Shabbat prayers that we do over the candles and the bread and the wine. And There's nothing any more or less sexual about our making dinner than the Mormon family making dinner. Ooh. I think I'll start off with some chips. Not yet. We have to have the blessing first. People are, are mixing up behavior with, um, with life, I mean, with who we are. This is just not, this is too mature for children in preschool. I don't think there's any, hardly any point where we're even seen together. You know, we're just being moms. How am I supposed to tell my daughter that the upper echelons of our government thinks that we are inappropriate and immoral and, and invalid and other kids shouldn't know about her life? It's the majority of Americans that believe that, not just the government. Well, we'll we, we could debate all of this another time. But again, Andrea yeah. Lafferty, executive director of the Traditional Values Coalition and outspoken opponent against equal rights for gays and lesbians, was the sole voice of opposition in the Good Morning America segment. Despite having no direct relationship with the postcards from Buster episode, PBS, or the Department of Education. In an effort to create fair and balanced reporting, mainstream media often pit LGBT people against opponents like Lafferty, making the debate about homosexuality rather than the broader issue, in this case, alleged censorship. I mean, that's, that's what we all felt was the problem. People being afraid of something that was different from what they themselves saw as being real and right. Bonnie is a friend of Tracy Harris and Gina D'Ambrosio, whose daughter Lily is featured in the Sugar Time episode alongside best friend Emma. And I think if I didn't know Tracy and Gina on a personal basis, I, I would have a, a more distant feeling about it. But I mean, that was really big for me. And I, and I haven't had a lot of other opportunities to see families in that context. And so that's why I think the Buster show was a great show, because it shows everybody that they're just families. Bonnie, a member of the Charlotte Congregational Church, was moved to action when the Buster story broke. We were having some conversations about becoming an open and affirming church, which is a, an official designation that talks about accepting anyone from any path of life, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, anything, everybody is welcome. And as we were having our discussions and sort of wondering, well, how would this go if we brought it up for a vote? In the news, this issue came up. When I found out that one of the families was from right here in Charlotte, I said, this is what we're talking about. This is it. 
And I called up the head deacon and I said, are we going to do anything about this? Bonnie drafted a letter that would be sent to the governor, Secretary Spellings, Pat Mitchell, and President George W. Bush. Our head deacon, Rick Kirshner, brought it up at church on Sunday and, and said, you know, I have signed this letter and the letter will be in the vestry during coffee hour for anybody who wants to sign it. And 70 people lined right up. No, step aside, please. The National Office of Bonnie's Church, the United Church of Christ, no has taken on similar issues. I don't think so, no. When we heard about the rejection of the UCC ads, we actually contacted standards and practices and corporate communications at both CBS and NBC, calling on them to clarify their statements. The United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. When you look at CBS, who rejected the UCC ad, they actually wrote back and said that because the president had introduced the federal marriage amendment, the anti-gay piece of legislation that was defining marriage as between a man and a woman, because that had been introduced, they couldn't run the ad. I think everyone in this country needs to be very disturbed by the idea that any broadcaster, any national broadcaster, would be making decisions about what actually airs based on public policy, based on the administration in Washington and what their agenda is. We have got to get out there and start doing you know, fundraising for public television that does not include our government. It's wrong. It can't continue. I mean, public television is everything. It's edgy and it's brave and it's, it, it's honest and truthful and sometimes it's not what you want to see. And I want to see that too. I want to see the stuff I don't agree with. The only portrayal that most of us saw for gays and lesbians was a lot of promiscuous sex and they were portrayed as aberrant or um, perverted. The media images out there can have an effect on public policy. They certainly have an effect on public opinion and that's something that often drives public policy. Kids are being bullied on this issue more than any other issue in schools today. Parents watch their children go to school like we do and get bullied. And it's not just our issue, it's everybody's issue. If you live in a right-wing conservative religious home and you are a young man, say 15, and you go to school and you are perceived as gay, you will be bullied. Does that not make it that parent's issue? We try to make our decisions in absence of, of what a current climate is. What we're trying to do, particularly with children's programs, is make sure that, that when our programs address a sensitive issue for kids, that they do it in a way that's really, that is that thorough, thoughtful approach. We're not doing anything up here that's a, you know, a big, scary secret. We're raising three kids, we're working very hard, and we're trying to make our bills every month. I mean, that's what the rest of the country are doing. I think we've done a terrific job in terms of putting a, a diverse um, sort of face on, on public television. And in this particular instance, um, I think we could have done a better job. I understand why people are nervous now, and I am different in public. We just got back from a conference um, in Las Vegas, and uh, it is so unlike me, but I was not demonstrative at all. I was, I was afraid. I was afraid to be out in that city, walking amongst those thousands of people that are so powerful and rich and they're throwing their money around and if they didn't like what they saw, you know? And that really hit me. So this has been an education, but it's also, you know, it's been really important for me because of the kids to say, if you believe in something this strong, then you need to stand up and you need to shout. And you need to tell the world that it's not fair. You know, and somewhere down the line, when they grow up, that's what I hope they pick out of this. More than anything, they'll stand up for themselves when they need to. When I was growing up in, in high school, 
I was, uh, I was pretty shut down. The, way, the other way that I got through high school was that I made myself invisible. There was a boy in my high school who was the identified gay kid, and he pretty much got harassed, beat up every day. What was really painful for me was to stand by and watch it happen. Part of what has been so gratifying hearing from young people in response to Rainbow Boys and Rainbow High has been you know, getting this second chance now to speak up for that boy and for you know, thousands of other boys and girls you know, like him. I'm Alex Sanchez, and you're watching In the Life. The art of spin has been described as a necessary evil of contemporary television. High production costs and ever-growing competition have led many broadcasters to make programming decisions based on good business practice rather than thorough news gathering. Tonight, we go beyond the sensational headlines to see what forces are at work in creating what has been described as the counterfeit news. You have to have an informed people to have a democracy. I've never seen an administration that has been so comprehensive in the way that they have approached uh, controlling information. We were asked to look into the use of prepackaged news stories. Controller General of the United States this week said that raises ethical questions. One of the things that they're doing, uh, that the Bush administration has begun to do now, is to produce video news packages that they uh, distribute to local news um, operations around the country. Uh, they're designed to look like television news reports. They'll feature uh, an actress um, or an actor pretending to be a reporter and using lines that a reporter would use, like, from Washington, I'm Karen Ryan reporting. In Washington, I'm Karen Ryan reporting. There is no Karen Ryan. There is no uh, journalist. It's a, it's a PR firm that is packaging and putting this together. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? Uh, there, there is a Justice Department opinion that says these, um, these pieces are within the law so long as they're based upon facts, not advocacy. There is a, an illegal propaganda act that says you cannot use taxpayer monies for purposes of propaganda. These segments uh, promote Bush administration policies. And now I'm honored and pleased to sign this historic piece of legislation. They distribute these video news releases to local television stations that uh, in many cases have just aired them without indicating that this was produced by the government. You think you're watching your local television news broadcast, but what you're really watching is a two or three minute ad produced by the White House. For decades, uh, our legal opinions generally have been complied with by the executive branch. Uh, the Government Accountability Office has actually found that some of these ads have run afoul of the bans on government propaganda and has told the Bush administration basically to knock it off. And the Bush administration uh, has said no, that they're going to keep producing them. It gives seniors uh, better benefits, more choices, and it's completely voluntary. It's important that if you're using taxpayer money to try to influence them, they have a right to know that. Uh, this has been a long-standing practice of the federal government to use uh, these uh, types of videos. The law represents the minimum standard of acceptable behavior. It's important for people in government as well as the media to do what's right. To do what's right, not just what's arguably legal. The second sort of strategy is to pay uh, journalists, to pay people who are um, like uh, Armstrong Williams, who got a quarter of a million dollars to plug the uh, education, no, you know, no child left behind act. Your report card as a journalist is on the front page every day or in broadcast. You can't, can't get away with it. The third kind of um, um, part of this grand strategy is to um, uh, find people that you can uh, plug in. The media made it out to be that how did this guy, a ringer, a plant, a shill, get into the White House press corps. Jeff Gannon was able to show up every day at the White House for two years and ask these obviously loaded questions uh, representing a fake news source using a fake name, and nobody cared. I'm Jeff Gannon, former White House correspondent for Talon News. There was a question Gannon asked President Bush at a press conference in, uh, I guess, late January or early February that um, included a, a false comment about Harry Reid. He, he made up a quote. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Senate uh, 
Democratic leaders have painted a very bleak picture of uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, Harry Reid was talking about uh, soup lines, and Hillary Clinton was talking about uh, the economy being on the verge of collapse. That got a lot of people's attention, um, and we sort of looked into who Jeff Gannon was, what Talent News was, and uh, some of his reporting. How are you going to work with people who seem to have uh, divorced themselves from reality? We found that this Talent News was really just a front for a company called GOP USA. And the GOP USA is uh, staffed and run by Texas Republican activists. None of them have any journalism background. They all have a partisan background. Uh, and, and the more we looked at it, the more we found that there was just no reason to consider them a news organization. I had uh, been a regular participant at the uh, daily briefings with uh, Ari Fleischer to start with and then Scott McClellan. And I usually got a question, and not always. But this was the first opportunity that I ever had for the President of the United States to point to me. Helen Thomas was a person who for years uh, traditionally was the first to ask a question in, in the um, news conferences. And um, they, you know, they, they did away with that tradition um, because they felt that she would be critical. They definitely have sanitized the list of who we should call on, and I'm not on the list. And because they know I'm going to be uh, ask a tough question. Bush so very rarely takes questions in a live formal setting from reporters that to have some of that wasted by this fake reporter from a fake news organization asking a fake question uh, was a real missed opportunity. You have one chance in the barrel with the president. He should be asked the questions, not his spokesperson, but the president himself. I'm a conservative. I'm an independent conservative journalist, and that seems to be a concept that's foreign to uh, some of these people out there. A lot of people wanted to change the discussion from Jeff Gannon's uh, lack of credentials as a journalist, his uh, employer's obvious partisan affiliations, to uh, his other activities. We'll get to the journalism here in a moment, but uh, ultimately, is it not relevant here? Is the most relevant thing not the fact that somebody in the government decided that a guy apparently using an alias who may have also run a website called hotmilitarystud.com would be allowed into the White House every day? None of these things have anything to do with journalism. And no one should be subjected to that kind of treatment. The whole point of this thing was to chase me from the White House press corps. A lot of his defenders, I think, are doing that to try to head off this discussion of the broader issue of the White House's and the conservative movement's manipulation of the media. And if they can pretend that the Jeff Gannon incident was about his sexuality or about the fact that he's a conservative in the briefing room, then they don't have to have that discussion. The gay and lesbian community are beginning to take a leadership role with regard to questioning some of the larger issues. Not that the gay and lesbian issues aren't large, but they are, in fact, representative of much larger um, concerns that are going on about w the ways that, that, that all, lots of people are being marginalized in this country. Nobody really asked, why is this guy here? Um, what does this mean? Is he an isolated example? Are there other examples of, you know, the White House using fake news, basically? What's happened to me raises questions, though, that need to be talked about. Who is a journalist? What, qual what are the qualifications to be a journalist? What is a legitimate news service? When is uh, when is a, a, a little bias too much bias? And who's going to make those decisions? Push for the truth, wherever it leads us. It's, uh, that should be the holy grail of journalism, really. If uh, there isn't a great deal of outrage among the American people about the fact that what they're seeing on their evening news every night is uh, may or may not be government propaganda and they have no way of knowing, then nobody's going to stop. The Bush administration won't stop doing it. Congress won't make them stop. Local television stations won't stop running these prepackaged news reports because it's easy for them. So that's the biggest fear that I have. And, and, the, and the scariest part of all this is that there may not be sufficient outrage out there uh, to make them stop. sued two years ago by a magazine company. It was a huge German conglomerate. They were allowed to call Kelly, my spouse, into a deposition for four days in a row, for 12 hours a day, and have her answer questions and make her cry in order to try to force me to settle. 
Well, I had no right to call the man who was suing me, Dan Brewster's wife, to the table because they were legally married. If they didn't feel that there was a public perception of weakness because I had come out as a lesbian, if they didn't see that as a vulnerability, I don't think they ever would have filed suit. I'm Rosie O'Donnell, and you're watching In the Light. His face has been broadcast around the world as the poster child for hate crimes legislation. His story had all the elements, the small Midwestern town, the brutal beating, the agonizing five days until his death, and of course, the arrest of the men responsible. Matthew Shepard was a great news story that galvanized a nation and sparked a national conversation about hate. Tonight, we explore how nearly seven years later, his story is still igniting debate. I'm sure he thought nothing was ever gonna happen to him for just killing another fag. They were two meth heads looking to get some money. That's what it was all about. The defendants are now trying to claim they were on methamphetamines. Ridiculous. Aaron McKinney explicitly, uh, by his own words, agreed to never do any media about this case, that it was a key part of the sentencing agreement that saved his life. Tonight, startling new information about the Matthew Shepard story, Secrets of a Murder. In November 2004, only two months after veteran reporter Elizabeth Vargas stepped into a retiring Barbara Walters role, ABC's 2020 aired the controversial story, Matthew Shepard, Secrets of a Murder. The, uh, the quick cuts, the editing, the stock, the blurred stock footage of the, you know, uh, area around Laramie and the, the meth culture and the flashing club lights and club music. And, it certainly carried you along into the place they wanted to put you so that they could funnel into you the idea that this was some kind of club drug crime. The reason why, you know, editing and imagery and B-roll and music works so well on so many audiences is they're not even aware that these elements are put together. The sad thing about it is it completely undermines a lot of the work uh, that the people did, you know, investigating the case, all the great work, you know, in gay and lesbian activism and hate crime activism that has happened since the crime. I mean, what, what good does that serve? And some people who appear to the story question the timing and the methodology of the production. Whatever side your documentarian is against is going to be, is going to feel that they were misrepresented in the way that they were, the way that they were shown. Yes, I am a grieving mother, but that's not my role right now. I'm trying to advance, advance the uh, gay cause, and, and to reduce me to that just was infuriating. When enough people feel that they've been um, really mishandled, um, then yeah, there's something, obviously something suspect. The problem with the 2020 piece is that it's not rooted in the facts as we know them. I've never seen the amount of uh, physical evidence uh, in a case as there was in this particular case. They were so dedicated to getting this case exactly right because you couldn't afford not to get it right. The investigators in this case did a tremendous job and under the weight of enormous and withering scrutiny from the world. In the Life invited 2020 to be part of this segment. After declining an on-camera interview, ABC Vice President of Media Relations, Jeffrey Schneider, agreed to answer our questions via email. And according to Schneider, 2020 producers consulted extensive trial transcripts provided by the court reporter. There is no transcript of everything that was said at trial. There are pieces of it. And one of the efforts we're undertaking um, on behalf of the foundation is to preserve and to recreate that trial record. Because right now, it exists only in the stenographic notes and data files of a court reporter in Wyoming. After Mr. Shepard confided he was gay, the subject deceived Mr. Shepard into leaving with them in their vehicle to a remote area, and upon arrival at said area, both individuals tied the victim to a buck fence and continued to beat and terrorize him while he was begging for his life. It's a case that's been solved. The people were convicted that were responsible. The case is adjudicated. It's done with. Every point was hashed and rehashed before, during, and after the trials. This is nothing has been new has been introduced. This thing should have been put to rest a long time ago. 
Tonight, a 2020 investigation uncovers stunning new information. The controversy over this piece centers around 2020 speculation that the crime was a drug-induced robbery gone wrong and not fueled by the hate that received so much public attention. It's as important to look at what's left out of a news story as what's included. You know, the, the, the details people choose not to include um, sometimes don't necessarily contradict the facts, but um, contradict the bias of the story. I was concerned about what, what the focus of the, of the piece was going to be, but we do the interview. And when it gets to the methamphetamine issue, I realize what was going on. And then the next morning I get up and find the emails on my dining room table that had been left behind, which indicated specifically that 2020 was coming in here with, with a specific angle, and that was the methamphetamine angle. Draw your own conclusion after hearing it. Although Dave is a veteran, highly skilled investigator who has a key to solving the crime quickly, he signed on to the hate crime motivation of Shepard's death, and our piece will ultimately contradict that flawed theory. And to me, it indicates very strongly that they came here with one thing in mind. They had a predetermined uh, focus on, on how this was going to come out, and so many pieces of it that were truthful ended up on either not asked or on a cutting room floor. The thing to do is to disclose the bias. You know, to try to, at the very beginning, come out and say, I've been looking at this story and I'm really upset by it. Here's what I think happened. It would be difficult to get into a court uh, the kind of case that 2020 assembled because of its heavy reliance on anonymous sources or people who only have a first name who openly say that they've been using methamphetamine for years and, and heavily. Um, those people's credibility doesn't tend to stand up in a courtroom, so. Um, it would be it would be very difficult for them to I think make that case anywhere but in the media. You know, if I had to walk into a prosecutor's office with a case based on that kind of information, they would they would la they wouldn't laugh me out of the office. They'd throw me out of the office. Nobody was on drugs when this crime took place. The ABC News theory is more subtle. It is that it was the after effects of heavy drug use that in somehow led um, to Matthew's murder. So that's a theory. It's speculative. When you ask what's the evidence for that, there isn't any, and you're not going to find it in this piece. But if you're in the middle of a meth binge, you're going to have uh, specific withdrawal symptoms. I mean, once the, the drug is gone, they never exhibited any of that while they were incarcerated. Uh, toxicology was negative. Uh, that combined with the statement that uh, Price gave that they hadn't had any for several days, uh, I'm comfortable that they weren't under the influence of methamphetamine, and that was not a motivation for, for the beating they gave to Matt. In a piece that talks so much about how being on methamphetamine makes you insane, how many of the sources for that story were themselves, in fact, potentially people exposed to that kind of insanity. The voluntary ingestion of either alcohol or drugs is not a defense. If that were true, everybody at Rikers would say, I was drunk, and they'd all be out on the street. Two young men are serving life in prison for the murder of Matthew Shepard. You will meet them now and hear their story in their own words for the first time. The killers say they agreed to be interviewed to set the record straight. Well, I think the, the exclusivity of interviewing both men was a big draw. I'm not sure there's anything else in the story that was big enough to make them do this. If they decide it's possible that this guy was trying to do a drug deal, then they owe it to themselves and the public to honestly investigate that. Despite 2020's promise to introduce their story in their own words, In the Life recorded how much time the killers actually spoke. Aaron McKinney received approximately one minute and 45 seconds to tell his story. Russell Henderson, approximately two minutes and 50 seconds. In the roughly 43 minutes of content, the total time allotted Elizabeth Vargas was approximately 19 minutes and 58 seconds. We asked 2020 why. Quote, this report featured a balance of key voices in the case. 2020 is in a position now of trying to um, elevate some of its second stringers to, you know, to fill the 
apron of <laughs> Barbara Walters, but um, and Hugh Downs, right, who left a couple years ago as well. So I mean, there might be more of a tendency to put these people's faces and voices more front and center. So the reason you attacked Matthew Shepard wasn't because he was gay. It was because you were strung out on drugs and frustrated yeah, very. and angry. Yeah, all that stuff builds up on you. It don't take much to make you snap completely. Why was the beating so bad if it was just a couple so, of guys? You have, you, have, you have direct testimony from Elizabeth Vargas about why this happened. I mean, that's what you got just really? there. He, he says... He says, all I want to do is beat him up and rob him. And she says, so you did this because you were strung out on drugs and frustrated and tired and angry. Well, he didn't say any of those things. She did. He said, all I wanted to do was beat him up and rob him. I think that's supported by the record. Some people have in their heads that it's not a hate crime unless McKinney and Henderson left their house that night looking for a gay guy to bash. If what you're asking is, was it a premeditated hate crime where they said, let's go out and find a gay kid and kill him because he's gay, that, that's the wrong question. That's not what the evidence suggests in this case. But it suggests that what, what changed a robbery into a lethal beating and a murder was anti-gay bias, an emotional reaction of rage fueled by that bias and hate. And nothing in this piece contradicts that. We all were under the same opinion that this was a robbery that went bad. Ben Fritzen, who was interviewed for both 2020 and this segment and a detective on the case, supports 2020's position. The county sheriff at the time went on record saying that apparently we might have a hate crime that we're investigating and it just went chaos from there. But lead detective Dave O'Malley argues that what's lost in the theory offered by Fritzen and 2020 are the key questions that have already been answered in McKinney's confession. Like when did the panic begin? Did it begin when Henderson and McKinney went in the bathroom at the fireside and decided to act like they were gay? Did the panic begin when they were in the truck? Uh, you know, when does this panic defense start? Aaron McKinney says in his confession, he tried, he put his hand on my leg. And he starts grabbing my leg and grabbing my toes. I don't know what the hell he was trying to do, but I'm not being about to that. I'm not a f***ing faggot. Those are his words. Did you kill Matthew Shepard because he was gay? No. For them to rewrite history, come on. Nobody's going to believe them. This is clearly a hate crime and was rightfully considered as such. And no matter what they cook up, what egg they lay behind bars, it's not going to change the facts. Someone to hell! That's God's anger! That we wouldn't be here! In order to write the Laramie Project, we spent uh, a little over a year in Laramie, going in and out, uh, conducting interviews. Uh, we conducted interviews with over 200 people. Our rule of thumb was that when those people saw themselves, that they would say, that's not only what I said, but that's what I meant. Because, you know, it's very easy in the kind of work we do to take one phrase, take it out of context, and have it mean something completely different. We knew he didn't deliver any of the blows, but he was complicit in everything that happened. He did nothing to stop it, and according to the law, that makes him just as guilty. Russell Henderson pled guilty, accepting two consecutive life sentences. But according to 2020, quote, McKinney committed all the physical violence against Shepard and struck Henderson in the face with the pistol when he tried to stop the beating. Did you ever once try and stop Aaron from hitting Matthew? Yeah, I did. I told him I think he had enough. Didn't do any good, because it didn't help Matthew any. He looked so innocent and so sympathetic in his uh, piece on this news program that you, you really felt for him. Henderson, at a much later time, said that he was trying to stop McKinney. But when I went to the autopsy of Matthew Shepard, uh, one of the things I photographed were a series of bruises on his arms, his upper arms, which was 
very indicative of somebody holding him from behind. And I think one of the uh, one of the hits that McKinney did on Shepard bounced off and hit Henderson in the face. I do know that uh, Henderson's attorney is seeking a sentence reduction, and it seemed to me that the program followed every point that his attorney was trying to use for the uh, sentence reduction. I was fully expecting the death penalty on both of them, but that came down to uh, Dennis and Judy Shepard's wishes. They did not want to pursue the death penalty. Aaron McKinney explicitly, uh, by his own words, agreed to never do any media about this case, that it was a key part of the sentencing agreement that saved his life. They didn't mention the agreement ever. Uh, you know, they basically broke the law. Uh, they enabled him, McKinney, to do it. So, uh, you know, of course they're not going to mention that they've done this horrible thing. I think it's a grave, grave mistake to ever bargain away maximum sentence under the law. If that case would have gone to the jury, McKinney would be dead now. I knew from the very day that they made that agreement that um, it would not hold up. I'm only concerned with that they don't speak to the press. I don't have any control over Henderson, but um, I thought I had control over McKinney. You don't want to wake up and see them on Good Morning America espousing more lies. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's exactly what happened. 2020 responded. McKinney was willing to tell us his story and as journalists trying to shed more light on this story, it's our job to report that information. People are thinking this is not an issue anymore. It's a huge issue. It's bigger now than, it's bigger now than before. Prior to this case, uh, faggot came off my tongue as easy as I love you did to my kids. I didn't think about it. The absolute ignorance and borderline hatred that our uh, our national leaders have towards this issue is like, it, it's absolutely uh, astounds me now to think that I was on that side of the fence. When your country's leader is telling you that being gay is wrong in his statements about the federal marriage amendment, uh, he's basically telling you that you have no rights, that you're not equal to, you're less than. Attitudes overall just take a dive. I mean, not just in the community, but their family and friends as well. What is the message that we're putting out there? And you know, where, where is our commitment to this egalitarian society? During the ramp up to the marriage debates, the president using his bully pulpit to actually call for a constitutional amendment to codify discrimination against this community, anti-LGBT violence rose 26% in those last six months. That's dramatic. And we haven't seen anything like that and hadn't seen anything like that in quite some time. Matthew Shepard's murder fueled the national conversation around hate crimes legislation. Ironically, this case was never actually tried as a hate crime. Wyoming still has no hate crime legislation. We have legislation that protects our animals, but not our people. A hate crime is quite simply any crime that is motivated wholly or in part by the perpetrator's perception of the race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, in some places, gender identity or expression of the victim. There is still no federal hate crimes law that includes sexual orientation, leaving legal protection of LGBT people to individual states. And according to the Human Rights Campaign, 29 states and the District of Columbia now recognize sexual orientation under hate crime legislation, leaving 21 states without protection. What sets hate crimes apart from other crimes, specifically, is the motivation for the crime. The crime itself is no different. It's the motivation. So the perpetrator gets a greater sentence, a sentence enhancement, strictly because of the motivation. Another indicator of hate crimes is often a measure of overkill. And that means that in the course of committing a crime, you could have stopped here. Instead, you went all the way to this point. In July 1998, three months before Matthew Shepard was murdered, Washington debated the Federal Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Many opposed argued that the inclusion of sexual orientation allotted special rights for LGBT people. It may seem outlandish to think that at some point in time, some straight person might need to utilize a hate crimes bill because a gay person beat them up because they were straight. But it does serve to point out that these pieces of legislation are not special rights. They're actually for anybody. More hate crimes are committed against those perceived to be gay than those who actually are. 
I don't think that the hate crime statute offers special rights to victims. What it does is allow prosecutors to seek enhanced sentence on specific crimes. The relationship uh, between bringing up bias based on gender identity and sexual orientation in a criminal trial is really clear. Gwen's family had to sit there day after day and hear that their daughter, right, who was beaten, strangled, buried in a shallow grave, was responsible for that happening to her. Every day we live for Gwen, every day we remember, every day we think about how painful it must have been and how horrible this death was for, for Gwen. It was horrific. How do you murder someone and then bury them and go and have breakfast at McDonald's? We're failing our youth in our schools and in our families and in our religious and social organizations by not preparing them to deal with what happened that night. I found it insulting to, to be uh, subjected to the gay panic defense. It indicates a complete lack of respect for the ability of a judge, a, a jury, prosecutors, the public at large to see what is plainly obvious about the crime. The 2020 piece uh, briefly addressed the gay panic uh, defense and, and they indicated that uh, that had been concocted after Aaron had been appointed an attorney but Aaron brought that out on his own volition during the initial interview before uh, he had uh, consulted an attorney. When they were trying out that gay panic defense, one of my coworkers said something to the effect of, oh, so he made a pass at him, so it was his fault. Well, by that logic, there wouldn't be a straight man left living in this town because every straight woman in this town has found herself in the position of being the unwelcome recipient of a pass. When they were leaving the bar in the truck. It, that is the time it appears that the robbery took place, when Aaron McKinney demanded Matthew's wallet and Matthew gave it up pretty easily. The question then becomes, why did the beating turn so savage? What provoked that? Aaron McKinney's girlfriend, Kristen Price, stated in the original investigation that Matthew's murder had everything to do with sexuality. Her original statement was she knew absolutely nothing about what happened, nothing at all and that she hadn't seen Aaron. And she came up with the statement that uh, Aaron was, was freaked out because this gay guy was hitting on him after they left the bar. She had like three different stories. Um, she said that Aaron came home, he was all bloody, um, he had a head injury, he wasn't making any sense. And uh, I believe that she did tell me that he told her that he thought he'd killed a guy, a gay guy. Now she's telling a different story, again. So when you told police that the reason Aaron attacked Matthew was because he was gay, because he made a pass at him, mm -hmm. you were lying? Yes. She comes out in the ABC's 2020 piece and says, um, I pretty much lied six years ago when I told everyone, you know, that I, that I thought that, you know, Aaron killed Matthew because he was gay. Okay, did you lie in court? If the defendant's girlfriend lied under oath, she could and should be prosecuted for perjury. That is a grave injustice to our justice system. 2020 acknowledges that Kristen Price changed her story, stating, quote, she made some choices that allowed her to stay out of jail and tried to take care of her infant son. She came forward to set the record straight. Her on and off camera statements seem sincere. Do you think Aaron is bisexual? Um, now I do, yes. In the 2020 piece, they try to say, well, he's bisexual, so how can he be a homophobe? That is so ridiculous. There's so many bisexual people that are homophobic. It is always the things that we most dislike about others that turn out to be the things we most dislike about ourselves. We all know that in every facet of our society, there is a certain degree of self-loathing. Women hate their bodies. Men hate going bald. Just because these guys now have decided that they're gay on methamphetamines and therefore could not have committed a hate crime is preposterous. The majority of the people in Laramie that I've heard from were appalled by the story. They have no idea where all that information came from. They're appalled that the Laramie people they interviewed were never, their, their answers were never followed up on. After all these years, we've finally sort of been able to convince the world that this is a good place, and they've just lobbed another grenade in. They think it gave Laramie an even worse view to the rest of the country than, than people already thought. 
and I'd have to agree with that. It was very unflattering to Laramie. I think that we live in a very savvy culture right now, and we can very easily detect bad journalism. And when something is not supported by facts or is not supported by witnesses or by sources that we deem trustworthy, then we don't believe it. There's room for reporters to make mistakes. There's room for misjudgments to take place. Um, I'm completely understanding of that, having been involved in more than one of them. Where I draw the line is, is being misleading or trying to shoehorn evidence into a predetermined theory of the case. And that's the line I think that was crossed at least once or twice in that, in that 2020 report. Smart journalism is about making your stories engaging while telling the truth at the same time. And that can still be done. You can still go and find out, well, why is it that there are all these people trying to say this is a drug story instead of a gay story? Who's saying it and why? And how do we evaluate that? And why would that happen in America now? And that story can be investigated and told um, without the moral conclusion that you set out, that you set out with, if you're open-minded enough to tell the story that, that that's actually happening. I'm Janine Garofalo. From all of us at In The Life, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next month.